Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller. It's January 28, 2013. Jimmy Lee Dykes boards a school bus in Midland City, Alabama with a gun. He orders the driver to hand over two children between the ages of six and eight. Dykes said no harm would come to the kids. When this story is over, he declared, the children will go free and I will die. After a deadly dispute with the bus driver, Dykes nabs a five-year-old boy named Ethan and takes him hostage. He calls 911 and says, I have a hostage and I'm in an underground bunker. Welcome to Behind the Crime Scene, where we take you beyond the yellow tape into the lives of first responders, investigators, and prosecutors who work true crime. I'm Gina Osborne, retired FBI Assistant Special Agent in Charge and former Army Counterintelligence Agent. And I'm Tracy Miller. I've been a prosecutor for 23 years. I've completed over 80 trials and I've handled cases involving violent criminals, including those who've committed domestic violence, juvenile sexual assault, and gang crimes. This is the first episode of our podcast, and we are so excited to be here. We are. We have a great show today. Tracy, I think it's important for people to understand that law enforcement isn't just a job, it's a calling. And we want to share the stories of our national heroes who put their lives on the line every day. And Gina, I think it's also important for people to understand that handling this, these type of cases often causes stress and trauma for the prosecutors, the officers, and the detectives involved, both for them and their families. But through investigating cases and putting on trials, there's often beautiful stories behind the crime scene from these life experiences. On today's episode, we will tell you about the boy in the bunker with our special guest, retired FBI Assistant Special Agent in Charge, Michael Osborne, who spent time in New York, Los Angeles, and FBI headquarters working crimes against children cases for nearly his entire career. It takes a very special person, Tracy, to protect children the way Michael did for two decades. The investigations aren't easy and you see some things that you'll never forget. This is one of those cases. Now let's go behind the crime scene and talk about the boy in the bunker. Welcome, Michael. So tell us, what do we know about Jimmy Lee Dykes? Jimmy Lee Dykes was a uh, Vietnam veteran, uh, lived in a trailer out in Midland City, Alabama, which is a small town, roughly 23, 2400 people and in a rural area. And he um, didn't trust very many people at all. Let's, let's just say it for that. He you know, was he, angry, right? Yeah, he was. You know, he he was angry at, uh, d disagreed with some of the laws, you know, local and federal laws. He did not uh, trust the government um, and trusted very few people out there. He, this was a guy that, um, you know, if if he trusted you, which like I said, he trusted very few, he was decent to you. But overall, people kept their distance from him. He was kind of that grumpy neighbor that uh, people kept their distance from. And the reports were that he had lost touch with his ex-wife and he didn't talk to his two daughters for years. Yeah, that's true. And that came, that became a critical aspect uh, later on down the road. So, you know, when we were trying to work through um, the negotiation process, uh, in some respects that helped us and in some respects uh, that hurt, hurt us. He seemed obsessed with guns and explosives and firearms. Well, he did. I, you know, he had, uh, he was known to, roam his property, shooting grasshoppers with pellet guns and, uh, you know, putting out antifreeze and things of that nature to, you know, he's alleged to have, have killed dogs and tried to poison dogs in the neighborhood uh, with the antifreeze. So, like I said, he was protective of his uh, kind of domain, uh, but, you know, he had also kind of mused about, you know, holding people hostage. And, you know, I think there were some neighbors that heard that or he said that too that you kind of wonder is this true or is it not and he'd had a past he'd had prior convictions yeah he did have a criminal history but i don't think there was anything in that criminal history to suggest that he would go to the lengths that he did uh back here in 2013. definitely a neighbor one of the reports said a neighbor referred to jimmy lee dykes as just a time bomb waiting to go off that's true. And, um, you know, it certainly happened in January of 2013 that he did. But 
Um, you know, there were some of those things where constantly we get the neighbors that would say, and we've, we've seen it many times in, in law enforcement, you know, you, you're interviewing people after a crime and somebody says, I'm not surprised, but I wasn't sure I should report it, you know. So Michael, how did it come that he built this bunker? So he planned for, you know, in the year before um, he took Ethan, uh, he went, you know, and bought a, a variety of things, built this six foot by eight foot bunker, um, partially underground, partially above ground. Uh, and, you know, he, he pr told his neighbors that it was essentially a storm shelter. So, you know, they, um, the neighbors actually helped him. There, there was a, a particular neighbor that helped, you know, part, dig part of this out with the understanding that this was a storm shelter and certainly out there um, in Alabama, that's what they, uh, that wouldn't be um, any, any crazy uh, request. So didn't one of his neighbors climb inside and he asked him to scream really loud so he could see if he could be heard? Yes, that is true. That's one of the things that, uh, that could be, that was said, at least we found in the interviews. And, you know, clearly we know now that he was just trying to find out whether or not anybody could hear him. So in case he wanted to, you know, stay hidden. Uh, but it was proposed that uh, he was just testing whether or not the, you know, um, law enforcement would be able to rescue somebody if somebody was trapped in there. So tell us about the days leading up to the kidnapping. I think that, you know, there was, uh, you know, I have to understand that Jimmy D. Dykes lives in this little area off of a four lane highway and there's a, a small dirt road that leads up a small little rise. Or, and then when you get to the top, um, that's where his, his property is with some other neighbors. And the bus um, that he ki kidnapped uh, Ethan on, that was, uh, that was, you know, it would go right up there next to his property. So he would, you know, cleared an area for the bus and to turn around and, and uh, the, the bus driver was appreciative of that. But what, the, what he was doing is he was setting up the uh, opportunity for himself to get onto the bus and kidnap the kids. And how did he do that? The bus driver, Chuck Poland, was a friend. You know, he knew Chuck uh, and he had established a relationship with him, had exchanged uh, food, you know, Poland said that he likes, you know, vegetables. And so Dykes would provide Poland with some fresh vegetables. To, and so I think that what he was doing is just establishing that relationship so that he would be able to get on the bus at some point down the road. And, you know, Dykes, the day before, you know, the kidnapping had exchanged some of the, some of the vegetables and said, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. And so when Dykes approached the bus driver and then the bus, you know, the following day, uh, that's in fact, you know, he had, he'd set that up. So he knew having built the uh, bunker and then having set the bus driver up, you know, that he would have the opportunity the following day to kidnap the kids off the bus. And Michael, this Chuck Poland, he was a 66 year old army veteran. And it seemed like they really developed a friendship, Dykes and Poland. Yeah. You know, Mr. Poland is just, the all around good guy, you know, he actually had told his wife, he goes, I think that uh, Jimmy Dykes just needs a friend, you know, and he, um, you know, he basically reached out his hand and not literally, but figuratively trying to establish that friendship and provide um, some um, friendship with, with Dykes. And, you know, at the same time, he was very particular about his job. He took it very, very seriously. And as we would all as parents hope that bus drivers would do, he knew his job was to protect those kids. And that's exactly what he did on the 29th of January. So like you said, someone that we want, we'd want our bus drivers of our children to be. He loved keeping the bus clean and orderly and keeping the kids in line and making sure they were all safe. Yeah, that's true. Like I said, he's just that guy in the neighborhood, you know, a small town in the neighborhood that you trust that uh, does his job and uh, is protective of the kids, but it also reaches out to those people that need a little help. So just like Dykes would exchange food with him, you know, Mr. Poland would offer to leave some eggs and some other homemade jam and some other things with uh, Mr. Dykes. And so that is in fact kind of what Dykes used to exploit. He used that relationship. He thought though that the friendship, if you will, that he had with Mr. Poland would allow him to get the two kids off the bus. But in fact, uh, he wasn't expecting the resolve that Mr. Poland had to protect the kids from that neighborhood. So tell us what happened. What happened on the bus that day? 
Well, Mr. Dykes, you know, got on the bus and very quickly, you know, the whole thing is on video and it's just horrible to see, but he gets on the bus and, and says, I want two kids. Uh, and uh, Mr. Poland refused. And he said, I just can't do that. And Mr. Poland was very, very calm. Um, and the, you know, the kids were starting to, to look up and, and starting to take notice of something that was going on. And, um, you know, then at some, at a certain point, you know, Mr. Dyke said, Hey, you know, I'm going to have to shoot you if you don't give me the two kids. And, and Mr. Poland was like, you know, that you, I just can't, I have to protect these kids. You, you know, you can't, you can't take to them, these two kids. I'm not going to let that happen. And that's when he shot Mr. Poland. Right in front of the kids. It was, it was, uh, he shot, shot him. And then, you know, the kids started to scream and you could tell they were trying to figure out what to do now and looking around and, you know, there was just pandemonium on there. And, you know, then Mr. Dykes fired several more rounds into Mr. Poland. Um, and then, you know, was telling, you know, as he was arguing with Mr. Poland, was telling kids to come forward. So, you know, you can imagine these kids of various ages on the bus that are looking and seeing Mr. Poland say no, Mr. Dykes with a gun saying, come here, kids. And the kids are like, I, you know, I don't want to go over there, clearly. You know, when, when Mr. Dykes shot Mr. Pohl and then kids are trying to figure out how to how to get away. And then Mr. Dykes shot several more times into Mr. Poland and then grabbed Ethan and, and took off for his property. The kids that were on the bus, one of them even called 911, Trey Watts, um, called the 911 operator. Do you remember uh, reviewing that tape? Yeah, it, uh, you know, that's... That certainly is, as a parent, you hope your kids are never in that situation, but uh, he did a fantastic job of relaying information and, you know, I think kind of leading and getting the kids off the bus through the emergency exit out of the back, um, provided some critical information uh, to the 911 operator, but you can even tell the 911, 911 operator was, was struggling just to keep the composure there and because she knew you know, how difficult a situation that could be with, with so many kids on the bus. And, you know, Dykes was very specific. He goes, I want, you know, two specific types of kids, well-behaved, you know, this and that, and, you know, uh, he wanted boys um, and so on and so forth. And um, he lost all of that when he fought Mr. Poland and shot him and just ended up grabbing Ethan and leaving. And Ethan was sitting close to the door when he grabbed him at the front of the bus. Was that true? Yeah, that's true. You know, so Mr. Poland had Ethan sitting at the bus. Uh, Ethan uh, had some special needs that, uh, you know, Mr. Poland wanted to make sure uh, Ethan was taken care of. Uh, just, again, shows you the type of person Mr. Poland is. And so uh, it turned out that that actually helped us to, in a variety of different ways, once we were started to negotiate with uh, Mr. Dykes. What a hero Mr. Poland was. Ethan, this five-year-old little boy, Ethan, is sitting at the front of the bus, and Mr. Poland basically died to protect him. What, what do we know about Ethan? Yeah, so he's, you know, five years old, autistic. You know, we came to learn that, you know, he had medication that he needed on a daily basis, um, which actually helped us, and we can talk about that shortly. But, uh, you know, he was up there at the front seat. Uh, Mr. Poland would make sure that he was safe up there under his eye. And, you know, he basically was taken by Mr. Dykes just because he was closest to Mr. Dyke when things did not go as Mr. Dykes planned. That he must have been so afraid watching his bus driver get shot and being drug off the bus while the rest of the kids are running out the back. Yeah, I think that, you know, the thing about Ethan, though, that helped is that Ethan, you know, where some things would, would stress other kids out, they didn't stress Ethan out. And so Ethan remained pretty calm throughout the entire um, scenario. And uh, that actually helped us in terms of us resolving the incident. Michael, you were the headquarters point of contact out on scene in Midland City. You arrive on scene, there's a five-year-old boy, he's being held in this bunker by Jimmy Lee Dykes. Can you tell us a little bit about Dykes' motive? Yeah, his only motive was just to get his story out. It wasn't complicated, but it was impossible to achieve. He wanted this reporter to come down into the bunker to record and broadcast his story. And then while the reporter was there, according to Dykes, he was going to hold the hand of the reporter and uh, then commit suicide after he was assured that his story 
had been broadcast. Well, clearly we, we could not put a reporter in that situation. When we come on scene, you have an individual that's in a bunker, only one way in or out. It's not a well-fortified bunker, so it's not like we could compromise it in a variety of different ways like we would a normal structure um, because you, you didn't want it to collapse in on itself, obviously, with Ethan down in there. It was a matter of just negotiating to get Ethan and Dykes to walk out of that bunker. How did you do that negotiation? How did you communicate with them? So Dykes called 911 and said, hey, I have a hostage here. I'm in my bunker, and I want you to communicate through a PVC pipe at the edge of his property. So he had this PVC pipe that he had built from the bunker that went up and poked up out of the ground right at the edge of his property. So that is, in fact, where we made some of the initial Actually, local police made a, some of the initial contact with him. The problem is that as more resources showed up and we looked at the pipe, you know, we wanted to make sure it was safe. And we actually x-rayed the pipe and found that there were explosives in the pipe. So he had drawn law enforcement into an area that he had previously set up with explosives. So he was, do you think he was trying to kill law enforcement? I think that he was, um, that was part of his defense mechanisms, that he was prepared to do that if, in fact, he felt attacked. Um, so, so we knew, you know, at the, you know, once we had gathered some additional intelligence, we knew that there were explosives there in the pipe. <clears throat> we also knew that there were explosives in the bunker. And obviously, he had the weapon, the gun, in the bunker with he and Ethan. So that makes it much more difficult to try to get Ethan out for you. Well, I don't think it gets any more difficult than that because the, uh, you know, what, one way in or out, you have a guy that's already killed somebody in order to accomplish his mission and, uh, you know, his objective, which is to set, tell his story, was not something that we were willing to let happen. So how did you communicate with him if they, you weren't going to go through the pipe to talk to him? So, you know, through some of the initial conversations, we uh, were able to, you know, get him a throat, what we call a throw phone. It's just a, a phone that we were able to put up there next to the hatch into the bunker that he took down in there. And that was the lifeline that we had into the bunker in terms of communicating with Dykes. So from that point on, our negotiators, um, we had you know local and federal uh, negotiators that were working together with our behavioral analysis unit and that was the team, that was like our tip of our spear, if you will, that um, they were constantly on a daily basis negotiating and just communicating with Dykes about a variety of things. Michael, what was the overall plan for the FBI to get Ethan out of the bunker? When I got on scene, the overall feeling was that this was going to be successful and we were waiting, we were going to wait him out, you know, um, to the extent that we could, if we could maintain, you know, his com you know, composure uh, on the situation. And if we could keep Ethan safe, then we would wait that out. There was no use in, in rushing a tactical option. Uh, and so everybody, I think, felt that that's exactly what would happen over a number of days. But you had a tactical option in place just in case that didn't happen. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So uh, the hostage rescue team, the FBI's hostage rescue team, uh, was established back in 1983. And that was, uh, this is a team that uh, really is designed for situations like this. They train exclusively for, you know, difficult um, hostage scenarios, nuclear situations, chemical situations. They train off of airplanes and, um, um, you know, helicopters and boats and so on and so forth all of the most difficult type of tactical scenarios are what they train for. So everybody in the FBI agreed this is, HRT is the team that um, needs to be here. So within less than 24 hours, they were surged to Midland City and there's an entire team of, you know, operators and logistical people and command staff and so on and so forth that comes with HRT. So as we were working on the negotiation, trying to work with that non-tactical, you know, solution or toward that, we were simultaneously developing plans on the tactical side. So HRT operators uh, every single day were going to um, the bunker and providing medicine and different things for Ethan 
Um, so that gave us opportunities to gather intelligence. And how were they able to determine Dyke's mental state while also being concerned about the welfare of Ethan? There's a lot of different things happening simultaneously. The negotiators and the behavioral analysis unit folks are collaborating. The BAU folks will say, hey, here, psychologically and from research, we can see that this is what we should expect from a person like this. The negotiators are using that information to develop plans to communicate with Dykes. Simultaneously, you have agents that are out collecting information from Dykes' family as also uh, in addition to Ethan's family. So we had, when you talk about Ethan, okay, well, what type of situ, what's, what is his medical condition? What type of medicine is he on? How often does he need that medicine? What happens if he doesn't get those medicines? You know, things of that nature. And those all factor into our planning. And simultaneously, like, you know, we talked about Dyke's family. You know, what is his family dynamic? Who is he closest to? Who might listen to him? Who, who should we be sure not to put in communication with him? Things of that nature. So all of those different things happen. And then, you know, there's a team of people, you know, that we all sat down and started to just figure out, okay, what's the best plan? What do we think we can accomplish in the next 24 hours? Go. At some point, um, although Ethan is occupied with the toys, does Dykes get more agitated? He did, yeah. It was, it was a roller coaster with Dykes. Uh, there were times where it was you know, productive and constructive. And then there were times where he didn't trust, you know, he, he would fall back on that. I don't trust anybody. Uh, you guys are trying to, you know, kill me and so on and so forth. And what about my plan? And so uh, it, the negotiators did a fantastic job of trying to keep things calm uh, because the, whenever he got agitated, um, then certainly we would, we would get a setback. Did things start to break down with Dykes at some point? It did. On Sunday, you know, he, uh, you know, the, the conversations with the negotiators were, we're making progress. We think we're making progress. We think we have, you know, control, you know, to the extent possible. And then on Sunday, um, you know, Dykes was making threats of not allowing Ethan to have medication anymore and things of that nature that really started to escalate things pretty quickly for us because obviously we weren't going to have a situation where we weren't going to, you know, make sure that Ethan had what he needed. So, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of discussion on Sunday about, you know, I think we're, you know, we're, we're a little bit concerned that we are losing control of dikes and we're losing kind of what the ground that we had gained over the last few days. And uh, then there was an agreement that let's see, because, Dykes would go to sleep every night and there was an agreement that we would just uh, see what happens the following morning to see if he had changed his mind. And this was just kind of one of those cycles or if this was going to be a sustained position that he was going to have. What day was Sunday of this ordeal? What day, how many days in? That was day six. So what was the turning point? The turning point was when he basically stopped caring for Ethan. Our options became very limited at that point in time. All of this time, there are interviews going on and, and negotiators are working. Well, you know, the HRT operators are using, every time they get a little bit of information, they use that to develop a plan or revise existing plan and develop contingency plans. And so over the five days, six days that they had been there, they had a number of different options that we talked about and they talked about. And I will tell you, no option was a slam dunk case. There was never an option that everybody just said, yeah, that's going to be, that's the right plan because it didn't have any problems with it. Every single plan had some significant concerns associated with it. But at some point you have the best plan that you can develop based upon the situation that you had. And that's, that's what we ultimately uh, found ourselves dealing with. So at some point, a 10 minute warning is called. Yeah, it's Sunday. The negotiators and EAU had basically expressed concern. Uh, we knew we had a potential turning point in the situation. And then on Monday morning, you know, that's when they started to, you know, we started to communicate more directly with headquarters and the director about uh, our tactical options. At a certain point, the director agreed that HRT tactical operation was approved. And that uh, at that point, the scheduling and, and the execution of that plan was uh, handed off to the executive team or the SAC on, on scene there. And uh, so we were in a, a small command 
post vehicle, just about, oh, maybe 10 of us. Uh, and uh, it was very, very stressful. And, you know, they, they gave a 10 minute warning to the HRT operators that we were going to go ahead and, and execute. And when you say execute, that means the hostage rescue team is going to go into the bunker to rescue Ethan. That's right. They had a plan and we were uh, going to execute that plan, right? And they had practiced, rehearsed their, their um, plan. We had a mock-up bunker that had been built that they had rehearsed on time and time again. And so the plan was that Dykes thought that his family member or somebody else was going to come to the hatch and he was going to be able to communicate with them. And so we actually saw him, you know, once they kind of gave the green light to HRT to start to move forward at that 10 minute window, Dykes didn't know it. We had actually, we were able to insert a camera into the um, bunker. And so, you know, he, at this point in time was looking almost straight into the camera and it was actually just looking into a mirror and was kind of fixing his hair. And it was very surreal looking at him almost looking straight into the camera, knowing that in less than 10 minutes, he was probably not going to be living. What was the mood like in your command post? It was certainly some of the most tense that, that I had been associated with. The, you know, everybody was focused on, are all the right pieces in the right places? So we had a helicopter on standby that was right there on scene. The pilot is in the helicopter. You know, we hadn't started the helicopter because we didn't want to alert media that something was happening. You know, we had pre-positioned ambulances, pre-positioned police vehicles for escort, all these different things, you know, that were critical to our contingency planning were all, you know, kind of just going through, it were kind of reminded me of like when NASA would shoot off a rocket, you just go down the checklist, is everybody positioned, is everybody ready to go? And uh, once, once everybody gave, gave the green light, then that's when uh, the command staff said to uh, execute. And then what happened? Well, then, you know, it was blowing the hatch and, and trying to get down into the bunker as quickly as possible, um, knowing, again, that, remember, you have one or two operators that have to get down into that bunker. You've got a five-year-old in there, and you've got a guy who's already killed somebody who has a gun down there, who has explosives. He's pre-positioned explosives at the pipes. And, um, and so we had to get down there. But he had also built that structure in a way that made it very difficult for us to get down there in a quick fashion. You know, you had different defense mechanisms built into the bunker. And so um, we had aerial footage of it. We had, you know, the inside camera. uh, And as soon as we blew the hatch, we saw him going for the gun. And then, you know, there was an explosion in the inside the bunker. And then we're, we hear shots fired, shots fired. That's when our, our operator was already down in there. And now we're just, you just hoping, you know, you don't know and you just have to let, let the uh, operation proceed and you have to wait and see what happens. What was it like in your command post at this point when you hear shots fired and you don't know what's going on? There was, I mean, there was no, no chatter, right? There, it was very quiet. There was nothing we could do at that point. You had to let a team of individuals that are very brave, that are willing to put their lives on the line to go down in there and save Ethan. And, you know, all of their team, you know, both inside the bunker and out are doing their job. So any involvement from the command post would have just been distracting. So we were sitting there, nobody was saying a word, and you're just letting the team do their work. And uh, we wait to hear, you know, once we hear shots fired, then we're waiting to, uh, to hear the status of that. What seemed like an hour later, I know it was just a, a couple of minutes, we saw Ethan being brought out of, of the bunker. That was a huge win, you know, because they came back quickly or pr- pretty quickly and said, you know, he's okay. There was a sigh of relief. There was some reaction, but it was not a celebration by any means at that point in time because we still had um, shots fired and we still had at least two individuals down in the bunker with dykes. So we're waiting to hear kind of their status. And again, what seemed like another hour, but only a few minutes, uh, they finally came back and said that uh, dykes was down and that he had been, uh, he was in cuffs. So he was controlled, but he was dead. So Ethan's pulled out. What happens to Ethan after that? Ethan is uh, quickly taken to the hospital, you know, for a checkup. He uh, had not been wounded by the entry from HRT. 
And I was over there with our child adolescent forensic interviewer later on that night at the hospital and had the opportunity to see Ethan. You know, he had a couple of family members who were there with him at the hospital. Obviously, the you know, it's a sm smaller hospital in, in the town and they had tight, tight security on it, didn't want a lot of people coming in there and so on and so forth. But we're able to see him and he was in a great mood. It was, you know, it was very great to see him just kind of running around, seemed almost like a typical five-year-old. And I just thought there, I said, I thought about Mr. Poland and what he had sacrificed to protect Ethan. And I also thought about, you know, the community and all the things that law enforcement had done collectively to get Ethan out. And what an honor it was to be part of that and to see Ethan there, you know, safe with his family. You saved him. You and your team saved him. How but, did that change your life? I think that, you know, certainly you learn a lot about it. it. Was It was surreal to see the things that stick out of my mind or just, you know, some of the things about leadership. You know, it was a great command post in the way that, you know, it was run. There was great collaboration amongst law enforcement. There was also great collaboration with the community. Too often these days, people think, uh, you know, that uh, there isn't collaboration between law enforcement and the community. And I'll tell you, you know, driving around Midland City, there were signs, you know, pray for Ethan and, and thanking law enforcement. There were, the command post was in the parking lot of a church called the Destiny Church, and which was ironic in itself, you know, the name of it. But also inside the church, you know, the community had come together. They made homemade meals, had them there, you know, almost 24 hours a day. They were there and there were volunteers from the community there just to give us assistance. And that was just in, can I get you anything to stay warm? Can I get you any food? Can I get you any drink? But the community was there doing what they could to save Ethan as well. Michael, when you and I worked together many years ago, you took me to a Crimes Against Children conference. And I learned from that conference that if you save one child, you save the world. And you have worked over two decades working these Crimes Against Children cases. What is your takeaway from that? How has that impacted you as a person? I think that you are right. You talk about saving the world because our children are our future. They are our greatest asset. And we have a responsibility to do everything we can to make sure that they are safe and have the opportunity to succeed as adults. And so it was always very rewarding for me to be associated with that and to rescue kids who are in difficult situations, whether that be exploited online or being held in a bunker or whatever the scenario was, it was just an extraordinary opportunity to work on child exploitation cases. And that's really the only violation in the FBI where you have to volunteer for it. It's a difficult, it's not for everybody. It's not easy to sit there and see adults take advantage of kids. And so, you know, you have a variety of volunteers throughout the FBI that are willing to do this and they do it on a daily basis. How do you recover from an incident like this? Seven days, that type of stress, that high level trauma, how do you personally recover? I think for me, it was a huge, you know, I'd been part of many, you know, command posts or crisis incidents. You know, some of them are, are um, you know, obviously not all of them were as big as this, but you learn from every command post environment. And for me, it was about the takeaways. What do you learn from it? What, you know, what could we do? You know, when I was, I was a headquarters representative. So for me, I was like, okay, what can we do as a headquarters entity better next time? You know, what do we learn from it? Um, but listen, it was tiring, you know, cause you're working very, very long days in those situations. But I think, you know, there's nothing like winning in those situations. An agent friend of mine, when we, we had recovered somebody who had been kidnapped and you know, I was fortunate enough to be there when we reunited that teenage girl with her mom, you know, this agent said, stand back and drink it in because there's no statistical accomplishment that'll ever capture this moment. So true. Yeah, you, you just don't, I mean, that's what I loved about you know, being in the FBI is having the assets and the resources available to challenge the most difficult circumstances, to face evil, right? And then to be able to be successful like we were time and time again, knowing that, you know, good faces evil and, uh, and good wins the day. 
Well, so it true. It absolutely happened in June of 2013 on this case. Michael, thank you so much for being on our show. My pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Gina, I cannot believe you got the chance to work with him. What a hero. Oh, he's amazing. You know, I watch Michael. I've known him for probably over 15 years, and I've watched his work and how passionate he is about doing his job. And his job was saving kids. And when you look at this specific case, how many people had to come together to make sure that Ethan came out of this alive is just remarkable. That's the part that I I was trying to envision when he's talking about the horseshoe of command post and all the different agencies it took to save this five-year-old boy. The thing about his interview that struck me the most, Gina, is when he said it was quiet. Mm -hmm. It was quiet in the command post when, when they were going in. You prepare for this as much as you could possibly prepare. And there are so many opportunities for something like that to go wrong because this Tracy was just, it was like a six foot by eight foot bunker. So, I mean, it was such a small closed confined area and the hostage rescue team operators. I mean, imagine being selected to be one of the two people that actually go down there to go into this gun battle. Gosh, it takes tremendous heroism just to, to go to work every day. And courage. And the other thing that struck me that we've both dealt with in our careers, Gina, is the amount of trauma that third person trauma and stress that individuals in our field carry Mm -hmm. after handling these incidents. It doesn't go away when it's all wrapped up. No, it, it doesn't. And, and I've often asked Michael and other people who work crimes against children. And Michael had mentioned a little bit that working crimes against children cases, that's the only program where it's on a volunteer basis. And we have annual psychological evaluations for all of the people who work these cases, just to make sure that they're okay moving forward to actually work them. Same in the DA's office. If you're going to do juveniles or adult sexual assault, you have to volunteer for the sex crimes. And I think that the time that I put Kids on the stand, Gina, was some of the time that I had the most nightmares during yes. trial because I would stress about, was I re-traumatizing them? And there's extra pressure to make sure that they don't have to go home. And most of the time they were living with the perpetrator. So if I lost, the kids would still be in the same situation where they were abused. Yes. And I was in charge of the Crimes Against Children program for five years as an executive in the FBI. And my people would talk about how they compartmentalize and they would be looking at child pornography images. They would be talking to the predators. They would be talking to the victims. They would be going into the homes of the predators and meeting the wives who had absolutely no idea that their husbands were predators. I mean, there's so much, like you said earlier, trauma that goes into it. And you have to be a special type of person to do that. And there was no way in a million years that I was that type of person because I could not compartmentalize. I couldn't look at the images. I couldn't do those things. However, as an executive, I could give them everything they needed to do their jobs. And that's exactly what I did because it was such an important program. I think that you're right about the trauma and it is so important. And I know that it's in our industry, especially with prosecutors and police officers, they're taught not to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's changing and, and I'm really excited to see the wellness of our profession be an issue with so many suicides that we've had in law enforcement in the last year in our country. And I'm so excited to see that we're changing culturally and it's okay to talk about this stuff because you're right. When The first time I looked at pornography, I wanted to throw up when I looked at child pornography. It was so disturbing, but to see people overcome and to see people like Michael be able to do this work and still and find a way to protect himself mentally and physically and move on. That's where the true stories and the true heroism is. Oh, absolutely. And he's worked huge, huge cases. I mean, he was in charge of the Jeffrey Epstein case before he retired uh, last year. So Michael has seen just the full effects of, uh, of what these cases offer. And it's really incredible. To all the law enforcement officers and FBI agents and prosecutors who do cases protecting children and giving children a voice, we thank you. We do thank you. And we'll see you next time behind the crime scene. 
Materials referenced in this episode include Inside an FBI Hostage Crisis by Michael M. Phillips, The Wall Street Journal. Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller is produced and edited by Lisa Osborne. Theme music is Insomnia by retired IRS Special Agent Clarissa Balmaceda. Find us on social media through BehindTheCrimeScene.com. And don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne and Tracy Miller wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lisa Osborne.